Hello everyone, Nicholson here, and welcome to Coming Soon Movie News with Nicholson. I'm your host, and on this show we're going to be breaking down all the day's movie news and kind of giving you a little bit of background into what it all means for the production in general, such as casting decisions, trailer announcements, director announcements, things like that. So, without any further ado, let's get into today's main topics. And so the first topic we're going to talk about today, I've been treating this all week, um, hoping that they would actually fin finally come through with it, and they did. 20th Century Fox has just released the first full-length trailer for Days of Future Past, uh, the new X-Men movie, Days of Future Past. And this movie looks absolutely incredible. I knew, I know a lot of you who watched the show, you kind of knew that this would be my response to it. Um, but after watching it, there are several different reasons as to why this is such a good trailer. Um, one of the main things is um, it was almost entirely comprised of new footage. They didn't really reuse hardly anything at all from the previous trailer outside of a few shots here and there. Um, but even those were touched up and, and done a little bit better, a little bit more finished uh, with the either the special effects or the background options or anything of that sort. They, they have done a really great job with isolating the different tones that they want to go with versus the future versus the past. Um, <clears throat> Getting to see some of the new mutants actually um, using their powers, such as Blink, uh, seeing her open up the portals, uh, and, and even them t uh, teaming up and, and, and fighting someone together. Like, Blink opens up a portal, and Iceman comes through actually on his little ice chute that he's creating, and he's blasting another guy. Um, you see Kitty Pride holding on to Bishop and running through objects so that he can go through them. Um, you see uh, Sunspot, uh, I believe Sunspot and, and Iceman are actually working together in the trailer to fight one of the Sentinels, one of the future Sentinels. And, oh, the Sentinels. Holy crap. Like, I, when I, I was one of the few people out there, I was really surprised about this, but I was one of the few people out there who really liked the design that they released for the future Sentinels. A lot of people were upset by it. They, they found comparisons to the Destroyer from Thor. And said that it looked very similar to that. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, when, when it comes to a humanoid robot, sentient robot that is a, pretty much a soul killing machine, um, the, they're both very similar characters or, or, or devices to be used. Um, so, I mean, with them saying, well, it looks like that. Well, that's like saying that, you know, Magneto looks like Professor X because they're both white. Uh, there's about as much of a comparison as that because they're the same type of machine. Um, so I was really happy not only to see the, the photo, but to see actually how they move. And not only how they move, there are so freaking many of them. Uh, you, I, I even lost count. There's got to be thousands of them. Uh, the, one, the shots of, of those uh, troop carrier things uh, that, that look like troop carriers, um, the one shot where you see them opening up and just the swarms of sentinels flying out of them. Uh, I mean the future mutants who are in danger of being exterminated because of these things basically are having one final stand uh, at this, I believe it's a monastery in, in China, or uh, I believe it's actually China, um, in, in Hong Kong. I, I think it's Hong Kong. I can't remember exactly where, it, I know it's, it's in China somewhere. Um, and they basically are having this last stand while Wolverine is sent, his consciousness is sent back in time to his body in 1973 where he meets up with the uh, young Professor X, played by uh, James McAvoy, the young Magneto, played by Michael Fassbender, and you know the young Mystique, played by Jennifer Lawrence, and so on and so forth, and attempts to stop Bolivar Trask, who is the creator of the Sentinels, in this movie played by Peter Dinklage, and a lot of people wouldn't remember Peter Dinklage from uh, Game of Thrones. He plays um, Tyrion Lannister, the, the, the dwarf. Um, he's basically sent back in time to prevent him from creating this super army of... Sentinels, and so that's where the main storyline falls in. But it's up it's up to Wolverine to try to mend the bridge between Professor X and Magneto. Because at the end of X Men First Class, hope this isn't spoiling it for anybody, um, but we actually see the reason why Professor X was put into the chair, and it was because Magneto was actually shooting, or or uh, who was he going to shoot? I can't even remember who he was going to shoot. Um, but um, but he def or Magneto deflects the bullet. Oh, sorry, it was Rose Byrne's character was going to shoot Magneto, and he deflects the bullet, and it goes into the spine of Professor X, and that's one of the reasons, or the reason why he can't walk. Um, so there's been a lot of tension in that, and he took Mystique away from him, who, if, if you saw um, X-Men First Class, uh, Mystique and Professor X were, were childhood friends. Like, they met when they were very young, um, and he kind of took her under his wing and, and really taught her how to try to blend in and be normal and actually try to have a normal life. So they had this really good kinship that 
was very rocky, if not almost completely destroyed, by the end of X Men First Class, and and Mystique went off and uh, and went to work with Magneto. So this movie is set about ten years later, um, 10, 10, 11 years later, and you really get to see, especially in the trailer, you get to see their their animosity between one another. But eventually, you see them kind of come to terms through the help of Wolverine to team together and to fight these Sentinels and and to do everything. But uh, I'm just going to break down a couple of things that I really liked about the trailer. Um, the character moments. Out of anything, I felt that the character moments were sub like uh, unbelievable. They're just supreme. Um, the one sequence in the, that just comes to mind, I can't remember if it's inside a car, if it's inside a plane. I think it's inside a plane. Um, but it's it's Professor X and Magneto going back and forth saying, you know, you stole the, the most precious things from me. And Magneto goes, you should have fought harder to keep them. Um, just that banter between one another. There's so much intensity, and you can tell the brotherly uh, rivalry that they're having. Like these guys have, were, for all intents and purposes, they were brothers. Um, you look at Professor X and Magneto, and Magneto was really on a lost path, and uh, Charles Xavier really helped him to channel all of that and to really find a purpose for everything. Um, and and uh, and Eric Lencher, who's Magneto, really kind of did a similar thing for Professor X. Like they had this kinship. Um, in in the first one, and you really get to see how that's kind of rock, very rocky, in this movie. But I mean, you know the 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 fact that you have that, you have Peter Dinklage's character, you have Mystique, who is still unsure as to what side she really wants to be on. Um, you know, she's got a past, she's got an idea of where she wants to go, and and I don't really think she cares what side she's on, just as long as as it gets done. So you really get to see a lot of the more uh, the the negative side of her come out, which I really I'm really enjoying from this. I, I it was inevitable with the the state of career that Jennifer Lawrence has right now that her character would not be expanded upon. That they would not try to get her into the forefront. It would have been like if um, if in in X Men, let's say James Marsden's character, James Marsden who played Cyclops, let's say he had three big movies in a row that just blew up at the box office. Everyone loved him. Well, you bet your bottom dollar that Cyclops would have come back as the main character. They would have sidelined Wolverine a little bit, or maybe just paired them up as the two leads of the team. Uh, but it, I mean, that's just the way that it works. The more star power you get, it means the more people like. So therefore, if you put them more forefront in the movie more people are probably going to come and see it. You know, so it's not really hurting them. She's a great actress. She does really well in the role. I really liked her in First Class. I'm, I'm really keen on seeing how she explores the, the further intricacies of her character. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. But um, I have I have a feeling that by the end of this movie, we're going to see, because there, there's one shot in the trailer, very, very close to the beginning, with Storm, and you see one of the Sentinels jump up from behind, with what looks to be a long sword or a long shiv, essentially, against against its arm, uh, comes up and looks like it's just about to impale her. Um, I have a feeling that most, if not all, of the future set characters are going to die. Uh, one thing to take into account, this movie is, the whole storyline revolves around time travel. So I have a feeling that within in the third act, everyone except for Wolverine in the future will be dead. Um, I think we're going to see, because we've already seen, kind of seen glimpses of what could potentially be that. We see Professor X, where he's looking up, and he, he kind of covers his face, and then you see a big, bright flash. You see Magneto, and he's using his powers, but there's a, there's a force of some kind coming towards him. I have a feeling that they're going to pave the way for the, the, the newer crew, and they're going to put a, a bow tie on the end of the original trilogy stars. And I think what's going to happen is all of those characters are going to die, and then through whatever circumstances happened in the past, they end up succeeding and they, they end up not necessarily killing Bolivar Trask, but they stop him from creating the Sentinels and creating the army and creating that awareness. Um, and that way, that changes everything in the future. And we might even see some original cast members come back. I'm, I'm hoping for, um, uh, for at least Cyclops. I, I, there's been some talk that Jean Grey would come back and that would kind of put a bow tie on... Uh, on Hugh Jackman's character, because remember, his consciousness is going back to 1973, so when he goes back to the future, sorry for the pun, uh, when he when he goes back to 2030 or 2020 or whatever year the future part of Days of Future Past is set, he's going to still remember all of that stuff. Um, so him seeing or coming across Jean Grey actually being alive, I think that could be a very, very 
interesting moment, especially if it's near the end of the film. Um, and that's setting up uh, Age or uh, X-Men Apocalypse, which we know Brian Singer just I talked about this on, on one of the other episodes. Uh, Brian Singer announced that the movie will be set during the 80s. Now, some people have had the theory that because they're using time travel with this movie, that they would actually find a way to bring the first class cast into the modern age, uh, into now, like 2014, and uh, have them team up with the Fantastic Four. I do believe that their goal is to have that, um, but they're obviously not doing that. They're setting it in the 80s, and then I have a feeling that um, in that movie, or in the next movie that they do, it's just going to be the first class cast now, and just them older. Um, but I have a feeling that that'll be the final the, the final curtain call, as it were, for the original trilogy stars. And, I, I mean, with this storyline, I can't think of a better way to end that tenure. Um, bringing back almost everybody from the original trilogy, at least all the main cast that are still alive, um, I, I think it would be a real nice finale, uh, a season finale, essentially, to that trilogy. I think that'd be really cool. All right, so um, before I get to any of the other main topics, I do need to announce, I, I posted this on Twitter, uh, and very unfortunate news, renowned character actor James Rebhorn, who some of you may remember from movies like Meet the Fockers, um, Independence Day, or Scent of a Woman, um, on Friday he passed away from a battle from uh, melanoma. He, uh, he'd been suffering that for a very long time, and um, it's just very sad to, to hear that an actor of this caliber, a really great character actor, who you never, he's one of those people where you're like, oh, it's that guy. You know, you would always recognize his face, but if somebody said their name, you go, who's that? Um, it, really sad to see him go, as it is with, with every death, obviously, but uh, I mean, the, the body of work that the guy left behind was just incredible, and uh, I'll always remember him as the Secretary of Defense in Independence Day. I saw that movie when, uh, that movie came out in 96, so I would have been nine years old. And I saw that movie in theaters, and I still remember that movie just the way that I did when I was nine years old. I loved his character. He was just a sniveling little weasel. Um, I love that. And then, obviously, from Meet the Fockers, his his, his go-to line was, Jesus, Fokker! Like, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's it, he, he's such a good actor. Um, great talent, and, and he definitely will be missed. So it is unfortunate, but and he will be missed. All right, so let's get on to the, to the next topic. Um, this one kind of caught me by surprise. I remember, w once this was announced, I remembered that, oh, yes, I forgot they were doing this, but Universal Studios has actually chosen the director for the upcoming remake of Scarface. Uh, now, before I continue, and before everyone starts losing their cool over them remaking a classic movie, one thing you have to take into account, Scarface starring Al Pacino was a remake. Oh, I know. You, you, oh, no, it's, you're wrong. You're wrong. No, I'm right. Scarface was... Uh, the first one was made, I believe, in the 30s. In 1933, if I'm remembering correctly. 33 or 36. Um, but it was actually... It was a Howard Hughes movie. Um, he had over... Or he was the producer. He had overseen the production of the original Scarface, which was about... It wasn't necessarily about them striving for the American dream, or, or it was an immigrant or anything like that. He was, a, he was an American character. Um, and the, the Scarface starring Al Pacino was a very different take on that storyline of basically a rise to fame and then uh, a really quick, quick fall. Um, and so they've actually chosen the, the director, and his name is Pablo Lorraine. Now, he's this will be his first North American production. It'll be his first uh, movie through Hollywood. He has done a couple of uh, movies in Chile, his home country. Um, uh, so the, it'll be really interesting. And... and for stuff like this, it's intriguing that a studio will will bring on a filmmaker of this caliber, uh, and by that I mean not established in North America. Audiences don't know their tone, they don't know the type of films that they've done. Um, so when you see it's it, it's like uh, some movies that are coming in, you hear the director and you're just like, who's that? Uh, you know, it, it it just even though. Everybody needs to start from somewhere. It doesn't instill that level of confidence. Like when the first one came out, it was directed by Brian De Palma, and it was written by Oliver Stone. Um, now, both of them were fairly early on in their careers, but they were still known, especially Brian De Palma. Um, and then you get someone like Al Pacino to star in it, you know, the guy from The Godfather. So, I mean, it had a lot of, of heavy talent behind it. Uh, this one right now, Pablo Lorraine is, is going to be directing it. Um, I oh, I'm forgetting the name of the writer. Um, I can't I can't exactly remember off the top of my head. I will uh, I will update on Twitter who the writer is. Um, but the remake is is set to be set in modern day Los Angeles, and it will follow a Mexican immigrant 
uh, as he rises through the criminal underworld striving for the American dream. That's the, the synopsis that's been released. There hasn't been any release date yet, but I mean, if they're announcing the director now, they're probably going to get production started within six months. This isn't a big CGI movie, so I would expect probably September, October 2015. Um, they may even do a summer. I doubt they would do a summer, though it's way too crowded. You're not, no, none of people are going to go see it. I mean, we got 2015 is next year, and that's the massive movie year. Uh, 2016 is actually building up to be a pretty big year as well, but we got the mega, the mega movie year, as it were, with 2015 coming up. So I'm really excited about that. I would say, if anything, it'll be fall 2015 or possibly spring 2016. So once we hear some more information, I will definitely update you guys on the page. So definitely keep up to date with that. Uh, the next topic is still in relation to Universal. Universal Studios has come out and, and given kind of an update on what their plans are for Fast and Furious 7 and how they plan on proceeding with that. So in regards to Paul Walker's character, Brian, um, we don't know the extent of how much they're going to be doing, but they will be using four distinct body doubles uh, who they've hired to say that they they match the body structure of Paul Walker so that they can do possibly close-ups or far away or anything like that. And what they're going to be doing is using CGI facial replacements, very similar technology that they used in uh, the social network to create the twins. Um, they're they're going to be CGIing his face and recreating using a computer his voice. Um, now, again, they haven't come out and stated how much of the movie they're going to be doing this for. I, I have... I can't see them doing more than 10 more minutes of, of footage with him like that and not a lot of close-ups um, and 10 minutes to me is stretching it like that's for me that's to, to finish off his character to have a, a one last interaction between Dom and Brian on screen you know really retire the character properly uh, as best as they can and and from what I've read his family is supporting this decision um, and if his family is supporting his decision, then you know that they've got more information than everybody, else, everyone else does, and how they're going to be handling it. And so, if they've come out and said that no, we, we're not, you know, they're not happy about it. Obviously, they're not happy about it, but uh, they are supporting it. And they feel that it is very respectful to both Paul and and to the character of Brian. Um, but I, I have two words for you. This is one of the reasons why I'm kind of worried about this. Tron Legacy. Now, for those of you who haven't seen Tron Legacy, Tron Legacy, the sequel to the original Tron, has Jeff Bridges playing two different characters in the movie. He plays himself about 30 years after the events of the first Tron. Uh, so he's, eight, he's aged. He's got his beard. He's got his gray hair. And, but then he also played Clue. Uh, for those of you who don't remember Clue, Clue was the character that he played, his computer program character version of himself that was at the very beginning of the original Tron. Um, and he, he brought him back. Uh, and and Tron was or um, uh, Clue was essentially the bad guy in uh, in Tron Two, but it was uh, Jeff Bridges who was about thirty uh, or thirty five, and so the CG replacement and I mean from far away it, it looked all right, but as soon as it started to move, you could tell it was fake. Like the eyes just the, there was nothing behind the eyes. This mouth just moved all rubbery. It, it looked like it was a CG character from a cutscene from a video game. Um, so again, I, I don't, I don't know. This to me is the best way to go about it because that way you're not hiring someone to replace the character. You're hiring someone who has a very similar body structure, and you're going to be CGIing the face. So that I definitely recommend, or I definitely agree with. I think that that's the best route to go for. Um, but I hope they don't, they don't try to finish the movie like that and finish the role that he originally was written for. And then add on a goodbye scene, like, okay, you know, me and the kid and I are, are leaving, we're getting out of this. Um, it's just too hectic for us. I have a feeling that it's wherever they got to, they're going to have one or two, maybe three more scenes, just little scenes with him to say, okay, this is what's happening. There may be a scene between himself and Mia, uh, his wife, maybe a scene between himself and Dom, and then a final drive off scene. Uh, if they do that, that's fine. If they try to squeeze in more than you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes worth of footage. No, don't, it's, do not, you don't have enough time. Technology's not there, uh, uh, rendering wise, like texture wise, they won't be able to make it realistic. They, they will just try to see how much they could have done with the movie with Paul Walker's final role that he was in the middle of filming when he died. So this will be his final on-screen performance. Um, 
and I hope that it's just to to retire his character, like they've said. They they have said they're going to retire, but they don't. We don't know exactly where. We don't know if they're just going to retire his character right where he finished filming, or if they're going to try to drag this out. We just don't know. So, the movie's not going to be released till April 10th. I'd be surprised if we didn't start seeing footage from it probably in end of the summer, beginning of the fall. Um, I'd say before Christmas, we're going to see the first trailer for it. They're going to really want to. People are wanting to see this footage and wanting to get a little sense of of what the movie's going to be like. So I have a feeling within six months, five to six months before the movie's out. We're going to see a trailer, so October, November, December time. Um, and the last piece of movie news that we have to talk about, this one actually came out just before I was about to record the show, and I felt like it was it's definitely important enough to get in here. Um, the other day, uh, it's actually also part of a correction. Um, the other day, on Friday, it was announced that Fox had all these release dates coming out, um, and one of them was for an unannounced Marvel, Marvel film. And uh, as I was reading it, because it said it was an unannounced Marvel film, and Marvel has all these dates that are set aside, the actual production company Marvel, um, I took that as to say that it was uh, the first movie for Phase 4, but it's actually a, a Fox release date, so it's an unannounced X-Men Fantastic Four X-Force related movie. Um, and a lot of people online are actually speculating that that is the intended date in... in um, March or sorry, not March of 2017. In July, I think it's July of 2018. Um, that that is the proposed uh, X Men Fantastic Four mashup movie. If that's the case, that's awesome. That gives them enough time not only to do they not they don't have any time to do X Men Apocalypse. They can fit in another X Men movie before then if they really tried and have it all tied in, but I mean, even having Days of Future Past and then X-Men Apocalypse could be the two main films leading into that. You'll already have had two Fantastic Four movies, because we have Fantastic Four coming out in July of, uh, uh, June or July of 2015, and then we now, they just announced the release date in June of 2017, I think it was June, uh, of 2017 for Fantastic Four 2. So July of 2018, we'll have two installments of each new franchise. Um, that are fairly fresh in people's minds, and so that really gives them enough material to cross over with. So that is really intriguing, but one of the other dates that they announced was an untitled Ridley Scott movie for March 4th, 2016. And a lot of people have been speculating, you know, what could this be? Could this be the proposed sequel to Blade Runner, which he's been talking about for the last few years? Uh, could it be the sequel to Prometheus that he's been talking about since Prometheus came out? Uh, could this be another project that he hasn't uh, that he hasn't announced yet, or anything like that? Um, because he's working on Exodus, the, the Moses picture Exodus right now, which will be released, I believe, in November or December of 2014. But it was just announced right before I was recording the show that the movie will indeed be, at least according to The Wrap. The Wrap is, is one of the, the sites that I get my information from. And it was announced that it will indeed be the sequel to Prometheus. So they are moving forward with Prometheus 2. They're eyeing for a, a, a shoot date starting in the fall. Uh, to have it ready for March of 2016, it'll give them a year and a half to film and, and do the special effects for it. Um, it is really exciting because Ridley Scott, even when he was doing the advertising and the promotions for Prometheus, he was always talking about how he'd love to do another one and our, our intent was to always tell this story, but I have a great idea of where to take it and it was always open-ended ending. Um, we never wanted it to be its own contained story. We want this to be an expansive universe, really tie in with the alien uh, mythos and with this movie, they have said that they this movie is going to be more alieny, as they put it. Um, so it's going to tie in more with the alien mythology than it will from the 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 set aside mythology that they dealt with in um, in the first Prometheus. The first Prometheus original script, which was called Paradise, um, really was more so of uh, an alien prequel than it was anything else. It had the xenomorph in it for more than just that little end teaser. Um, a lot of the characters are very similar, but it mainly was about the, the the space jockey and the xenomorph, the alien itself. And when Damon Lindelof came on, he really changed it. He he had this better idea for more of a religious based movie, like religious versus versus technology. Um, and they just took those two scripts and just combined them and and tried to do their best with two separate storylines and trying to just weave them into one another. And I, I really liked Prometheus. I, I thought that it was a grand um, uh, experiment, if you will. Um, I, I felt 
I felt it was really ambitious. You know, it was a very smart story. It made you think a lot. And I think that's why a lot of people didn't like it. I know there were a lot of plot holes in the movie and a lot of things that didn't quite make sense. Why did they have a geologist go on a mission where he's he's cryogenically frozen for two years or however long it's been um, to go out and explore an unknown planet and be afraid of the fact that, oh, aliens might be here. You know, you're on the other side of the galaxy on another planet that is hot, that is habitable. And then he freaks out and goes away. Or you get the other geologist guy or, or, or the, the biologist dude. When you see that weird slithery snake thing come out of the water and he's, oh, hi, cutie. Hello, cutie. And, you know, putting his hand up there and it attacks him and breaks his arm off. and That, that was just dumb. Uh, very dumb for them to have that. And then they call it the, uh, the Prometheus running, the, the, school, the Prometheus school of running away. Uh, where you get uh, you get the characters running away from something that's rolling towards them. It's only let's say it's only about that wide. And it's rolling towards you. They're running the exact same direction that uh, that it's rolling instead of just going off to the side. There were a lot of plot holes with the movie, but uh, this one here is going to be from the get go going to be realized as more of an alien influenced movie. Um, and and one thing that also uh, the report stated was that there's apparently is not confirmed. None of this is actually confirmed. This is this is a story that that the rap is running with. The rap is one of the more um, uh, reputable sources that are out there. The main ones uh, to really look at. If they post something, there's a the, probably ninety five percent chance that it's correct, if not higher. That would be the rap, uh, Deadline, and Variety. Uh, more so Variety than any of the others. They they've rarely gotten one wrong. Um, Latino Review is actually pretty good as well, but they've been rather hit and miss as of late. Um, but the fact that there, there's going to be potentially multiple David androids, uh, not just the one. Because the one in, in the first one uh, is bodiless now. Like she, she brought his body with them onto the ship. And the ship was taken off at the end, going off to the, uh, the engineer's homeworld. And um, when, when you think about something like that, like how, how are they going to explain something like that? Unless they get another ship or unless they go back to Earth or, or something, it, it wouldn't make sense because where were all the other uh, David androids? Why was there only just one who was walking around? If there's going to be multiple, that they got to have something that's going to make that make sense, whether or not they get to another planet and potentially they deal with multiple timelines and multiple different universes. and you know that they, they could get really creative and really kind of funky with this universe. That they have a lot of room to play with. They don't necessarily need to keep it in the alien universe. If they keep wanting to tag tag that in there, that's fine. Uh, but you have a lot of room to play with and a lot of really great ideas that can come out of that. Um, but the report does state that uh, that they're looking to ex to continue exploring the creationist. Uh, angle that they set up in the first one where these engineers were technically our gods. Uh, one comment that they made, they tried to include in the original Prometheus, but they couldn't just due to time constraints, was that the engineers, the reasons why the engineers actually wanted to eradicate the citizens of Earth were because when they originally put us there, they, they went and checked back up on us, um, and the emissary that they had sent to check on us, we originally had had believed him or some of us had believed him to be our God and then we crucified him. So they're trying to tie in the fact that the role of Jesus Christ was actually one of these engineers um, and when we killed him essentially um, they're saying okay well our experiment failed you guys are done and we're going to eradicate you and we're going to start fresh somewhere else. So this new movie is supposedly going to explore paradise or what is being referred to as the home world of the engineers and as most people it, it, at least at least in literature and, and in movies, when someone actually gets to paradise, it's the exact opposite of what they had assumed, and it's very kind of ominous and and uh, and, and kind of scary and terrifying. It's it's because you can never get to paradise. Paradise in itself would be chaos, um, because everything would be perfect, and and nothing can ever be perfect. Because if everything's perfect, nothing's perfect. Like it just it perfect means that it's above everything else, and if everything is that way, then you can't have perfection. You'll just get bored. It's like how if you go out and if you were given you know a million dollars right now and you went out and bought everything that you wanted within a year or two you'd start to get bored uh, because you would you've already have everything you get used to it all so um, th they're going to explore that creationist angle a little bit further in this one as to where they came from what their purpose was and I think that uh, that with Numi Rapis's character uh, she's going to want to even go further than that she's not going to accept anything that they tell her I'm pretty sure that that's what's going to happen which would be a really intriguing angle for them to go with uh, they are going to they said they are going to answer more questions 
that were answered in Prometheus than they are going to ask new ones. Uh, but they're still going to be that. You're not going to be sitting there going, well, what? I mean, they, they did this, they did this, they did this, but, but they didn't answer this, they didn't answer this. So we got all this new information. We never really got any answers on the old stuff. So only time will tell. But um, that'll about do it for us today on Coming Soon Movie News with Nicholson. Thank you guys so much for watching. You've been a great audience. And don't forget to check back on Wednesday's episode where we'll be discussing the brand new Tom Cruise sci-fi actioner Edge of Tomorrow. They're, they're releasing a new trailer tomorrow night for it. Uh, and so we'll definitely have that uh, that up and, and ready to talk about on Wednesday. So if you haven't already, don't forget to click the subscribe button. Uh, it will be up on the following page as well. And don't forget to click uh, or to follow me on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Nicholson, N-I-K-L-S-U-N, to get updates on all of your movie-related news. So without any further ado, this has been Nicholson. You guys have been great, and enjoy your day. Take care.